Next tonight, a special Black History Month focus. Last week, seven African-American writers came together at a forum sponsored by the Knopf Publishing Group. They were Derek Bell, author of Faces at the Bottom of the Well, The Permanence of Racism. Elaine Brown, author of A Taste of Power, A Black Woman's Story. Stanley Crouch, author of Notes of a Hanging Judge, Essays and Reviews, 1979 to 1989. Ralph Ellison, author of Invisible Man. John Edgar Wideman, author of Philadelphia Fire. Patricia Williams, author of The Alchemy of Race and Rights. And Kwame Ture, who co-authored Black Power, The Politics of Liberation. In the late 60s, Ture was a leading civil rights activist known as Stokely Carmichael, and his call for black power back then was a turning point in the civil rights movement. As moderator of the panel, I put the first question to him. I read a quote recently by the activist uh, Angela Davis who said that the predicament of black people today is as bad as I have ever seen it in my lifetime. Starting with you, Kwame, do you agree with that statement? And if so, what happened to the highly energizing, galvanizing force of black power, which you first articulated in our generation uh, back in 1968? Well, I would say with uh, Comrade Angela Davis that it's the best of times and it's the worst of times. And I think that in this case, we must make clear analysis. There's no question that the conditions of Africans in this country are worse than ever before. But there's also no question that the consciousness of Africans in this country are higher than ever before. If you will look more and more, you will see that the African masses, especially since April of last year in Los Angeles, their instincts for struggle are clear. They have no intention of submitting to any force of capitalism. What is lacking, however, between the 60s and the 90s, and here a lot of confusion arises, is a difference between mobilization and organization. When we become organized, we will make proper revolution in the United States of America. Uh, well, there we are. I think the idea that uh, Afro-Americans are in a worse condition than they've ever been in is absolutely ridiculous. The, 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 the problem often that we have is that we attempt to separate what happens to people of color, as, it used, as we used to be called in this country, from the, from the great waves of the society at large. That is, the, the, the decline of public schools, the, 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 uh, the nature of political corruption, a number of things that affect everybody in the United States have affected us. And we can't, we're not in some side pocket of reality that has nothing to do with the sweep of the so society. Well, let, further, let me ask further, you. further, with over 3,000 black officials, of, of various positions of power uh, in, uh, presently active who were not there 30 years ago, with uh, almost every major city governed by uh, a black mayor, with um, the, 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 whole, the whole visual vision of what, of what constitutes America being changed by the presence of many different black people, from athletes like uh, uh, Michael Jordan all the way over to people like Tom Bradley, Bill Cosby, et cetera. I don't think we can really, I don't think we can be, we can be so reductive and defeatist about what has happened to just, to just lump it over into, into another Marxist simplification of things that falls down into haves and have-nots when Duke Ellington said quite correctly that the problem in the United States is probably really the problem of the haves and the want-mores. I, I want to pursue some of the points you raised, but let me ask you this, because you said that at, at, a, at a certain point that black power was the worst thing that ever happened to the black movement. I think that black power is Mr. Carmichael, excuse me, sir, Mr. Turay, and uh, other Everybody names still smells the same. Yeah, that's true. That's, <laughs> just as revolutionary. Yeah, I understand. I understand, as, as we all do. Um, I, well, what happened was that it splintered the movement. It splintered. We had we had a we had a a, a multiracial movement that was splintered by black power. That was uh, what was engendered by black power was a lot of race baiting. We had we. Uh, uh, Mr. Carmichael uh, popularized yeah. the term. Stanley, you, wait, wait, you wait, said wait. that in '67. You can't believe that today. No, wait a minute. Yeah, I mean, she, you said that back uh, yeah. 20, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. You can't believe that today. Well, wait a minute. Are we are we going to deal with what actually happened then, or are we not? Well, I'm just are saying. We, are I we, just are wanted we not? clarification. Are we? Are we not? Do you, do you still now, believe I mean, it? I mean, did 
Do you still it? believe that? The honky baiting and all that was very bad for, 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 for politics? Yes, I think so. And I think that we're still suffering from, 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 from the leftover residue of that that has created a number of, of, a lot of resentment in many different pockets of the United States, many of which you probably had to deal with yourself. I was one of those 60s people that uh, looked at Stokely Carmichael on television and uh, was uh, mesmerized by the notion of, of power and by empowerment. I think that Kwame is absolutely correct in his analysis of the conditions today. The conditions, we are not talking about three baseball players. I'm not impressed by Michael Jordan getting a Nike contract. I don't think that has anything to do with the masses of our people today or yesterday. And the fact that he has that is because Watts blew up. It's because there were mobilizations. It's because there were organizations. That is why he has a Nike contract, not because he plays basketball so well, though he does, and this is not to isolate him, but to talk about we can't, we can't deal with stars and movie stars or events. But I would like to get back just to the question of the reference back to this issue of black power. I think that the consciousness is high. I have seen that consciousness. But the poverty and the isolation and the racism is more embedded in this country because it's in the fabric of this country. This culture of racism has passed down through to this day. It has never been addressed seriously other than by black people. And now we have Aretha Franklin singing at the inaugural and all is OK. No, that is not OK. So I don't care how many black mayors there are in America, uh, notwithstanding Tom Bradley. I do not care because the fact is that the economic power and that the main power in this country is there is still a divided country. We are still Africans lost in America as far as I'm concerned and that we do have to address our, our issues on our own because I don't believe that there's an agenda for assimilation and as for me, I don't want to be assimilated into an, an environment that has committed genocide on other peoples, that has endorsed chattel slavery and institutional oppression. Comrade uh, Stanley says that now we have all these mayors. In 1965, the Africans rebelled in Watts. Yorty was mayor, a white man. You can call him a racist. In 1992, they rebel. Bradley is mayor. He's an African. What is the objective difference here? The only difference is that American capitalism, in order to try and deceive the people, tries to give us visibility without any power at all. Right. As you yourself point out, Comrade Stanley, Africans <laughs> in this country have more elected officials than any other ethnic group in the country. We have no power at all. Do you agree uh, with that, Derek Bell? First of all, most of the mayors are in very small areas. So we talk about 3,000 elected officials. Most of them are in very small areas. And, and usually, 7,000, 7, and, and usually without, uh, they're not uh, uh, politically um, potent uh, positions. If you ask me, would I rather have them in or not, I'd rather have them in. But we have to look realistically to exactly. what being in office really means. Okay. It means more than nothing, but nothing like what we had hoped uh, political power would bring. Ralph Elson, your vision spans a longer period than many of the people on this panel, uh, longer than Angela Davis uh, in the original quote. How, how do you respond to her analysis and what you've heard here? I mean, is the predicament of black people as bad as, as all that? Well, in the first place, I have difficulty in uh, separating Americans uh, into uh, utterly opposed groups. What we don't want to recognize is that this country is being created. It's in a process of improvisation, and we all take part. Uh, there <coughs> has to be some reasons for uh, uh, protest groups. I've been a protester, and, but there are many ways of protesting. The other thing to say is that uh, the country won't change just because it becomes more integrated. It has to be a continuous process, a conscious process, and one where an, we all accept our diversity, and yet the unity within that diversity. Does that sound Marxist enough, sir? <laughs> <laughs> so long we off. <laughs> Patricia Williams, let's get your take on this in terms of best of times, worst of times, progress, no progress. What's your analysis? Well, I'm probably on the pessimistic side of things, but I would express it very differently. Yes, there are blacks in power who are used as the exception to prove the rule, but there are also blacks in power who literally want to jump out of their skins, like Michael Jackson, who wants a young white boy to play his part. 
um, this level of, 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 of him as a youth in his, in his movie. And, and it seems to me this level of what the civil rights legacy and the black power legacy has devolved to, which is almost an assimilation into, I mean, this has always been present in, in the black community, um, but now goes completely uncritiqued, completely unseen as a kind of psychosis that is very much part of the interdependence of white and black relations in this, in this country and of all immigrant sort of and, and ideals that, I, I don't know how we address that. Patricia Williams, you put a lot of things on the table, but the one that I want to pick up on, is there a single agenda for black people? Is there an, and is there a single black community? And how do you deal with the nuanced nature of African Americans uh, in, in terms of developing solutions to the problems? All right, I think John Edgar Reiterman wants to get in on this. <coughs> Well, I would hope there is no single agenda because nobody's smart enough to put together an agenda that doesn't have just as much chance of taking us to heaven or to hell as to heaven. Uh, why would we want a single agenda? Uh, who do you want to speak for you? I don't want anybody to speak for me. I think some people I can agree with, some people I certainly would support with my life, but I'm not going to put my fate into someone else's hands. Well, are you as pessimistic as most of the other panelists about uh, the achievements that African Americans have won since, say, the late 60s? Well, I'm very pessimistic, uh, very, very pessimistic, simply because in many ways I agree with Mr. Ellison, and that is um, our fate is tied up with the fate of America, at least until we do something very drastically different uh, as a group. And, it's, and America's fate, of course, is tied up with the world's fate. We are not going to change anything that happens to us if we do not affect, if we do not make the condition, the problem, an American problem. As long as a problem exists as a problem for some splinter group, you know, that group is not going to be able to affect, it's not going to be able to affect enough people to begin to change policy. The fact is that this, this country's policy doesn't measure it as good or bad as the w same way we do. It measures what is in the country's interest, or at least those who are able to make a policy. And therefore, blacks can be pleading, praying, petitioning, right. revolting, whatever we do. It won't make any difference until there is a perception that what we want will move the society in the way that they want, want it to go. Isn't that, so, the, it, but isn't that what, what was said earlier, that the fate of African Americans is tied to America? No, well, that's, that's a different, no, that's a very different, different it's a very different Absolutely. thing. Sorry. Well, I'm just asking it, you to clarify it. I mean, what no, is the difference? Whenever this country sees that there is a benefit to it, uh, albeit a sacrifice to us, uh, we better get ready for, for that sacrifice. On the other hand, when that which we want uh, corresponds with, uh, with that that seems in the country's interest, such as getting rid of official segregation, which had outlived its usefulness by the end of exactly. World War II, exactly. then, th uh, then we, with great struggle and sacrifice, are able to do that which the country wants. Now, what happened, and the, and the thing that, that, that causes me so much pain, having worked on all this stuff, is to see that Notwithstanding the advances and the changes, the fact is that equal opportunity has rendered us, in many ways, worse off than we were under separate but equal. Exactly. And how could you have ever imagined that that would happen? Exactly. You see, but we did exactly what we thought was in our interest, but was in the country's interest more than it was in our interest, and has Hello. rendered us worse off, worse able to help those of us more, uh, which is a substantial percentage, down on the bottom. Can you be specific about how, Derek? Well, give me a couple of examples. This, when when uh, when I grew up in the 30s and 40s, all black people lived in one area in Pittsburgh. I don't care whether you were a working person or a professional or what have you. My models, the people who caused me to want to go to law school, were people I delivered the paper to and who encouraged me. Those people, including myself, don't live in those communities because equal opportunity has allowed us to move out. My audiences say to me, you keep talking about that racism, Bell, but you're black, you must have faced discrimination. 
you made it. You've made Why it. <laughs> can't the rest of them do like you? Mm -hmm. That my very success becomes an excuse to do nothing for, for the folk. And what I have to do every day is remind myself that I am an evil. And the question is whether I'm going to be a necessary evil, you see. Stanley Cross, you, do you, 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 you don't agree with that? I think it's absurd. Uh, I think that Mark that word. When yeah, they right. carry him, his What's behind. that, think or absurd? <laughs> <laughs> well, which word, which word, think or absurd? <laughs> I think, look. I always said you were. See, I mean, I mean, I mean, uh, and I cannot give in to Mr. Bell. To Mr. Mr. Carmichael, to Ms. To, to, to Ms. Ms. Brown and Ms. Williams, that that in some way that we have no effect on what happens, and that the only thing that, ever, that we ever do is is perform as some puppet, where the uh, uh, who who moves at the behest of the of the national interest. The national interests are often affected by the vision that we bring into the dialogue, and we are the people who have. It was because of what happened to us at the end of, of, of Reconstruction that the whole question of states' rights, uh, states rights versus the and, the and the interpretation of the Constitution and the relationship of the federal government to the Constitution became started a 90-year struggle in which we ended up affecting people like Lyndon Johnson finally, who changed all kinds of things. I guess uh, Kwame Ture, you want to respond, right? We need to go back to process. I think that's what the Thank confusion you, is. Because some Africans in this country have arrived at certain positions which they didn't dream about when they were five years old, 42 years ago. Consequently, if you're speaking about integration, you must speak about the process. In everything that Africans got in this country, just reform, which everybody else get, we have to shed our blood. Matter of fact, we're the only people who shed blood for reform, not even for revolution. Mm. <laughs> to sit at a lunch counter, you got to shed your blood. To get on the bus where you want to sit, you got to shed your blood. Please. To go to school where you want to go to school, you got to shed your blood. To live in a community where you want to live, you got to shed your blood. You cannot name me one advancement that Africans have made in this country without having shed our blood. And when you think that that blood has now been shed and you come to occupy the position and forget the process which brought you there, it's an act of betrayal. I think that the idea in this country, the, the, the idea of race, is a fundamental poison and that as a source of this country, uh, it has continued to flourish unchanged from day one, from the time that Europe and Africa first met <coughs> in the 1400s, 1300s. From that point, racism began to develop as an idea, as a poison. And white identity, European identity, is so closely related and intertwined with this flourishing racism that we cannot attempt any longer to address white interests when we try to resolve problems of race. Because a white interest is in racism. I don't think that race is the sole issue. I think I'm talking about oppression. I'm talking about people who are poor. I'm talking about poor whites. I'm talking about native peoples who are here that everyone has abandoned in their agendas. But as toward the black agenda, I suggest that there are two big event, two big things that we might address in terms of agenda. One, at the highest level of government to protest, to, to, to push for, for example, uh, Clinton, not Bush, being president now, to say, listen, let's settle some of these questions. Let's acknowledge that there was a crime of chattel slavery. Let's acknowledge that there, we're not, don't use code words of inner city, cutting welfare benefits when you know who, all along what we're all talking about. Let's acknowledge the racism in this country by acknowledging the crime of chattel slavery, and let's begin to then heal that wound by looking at it. And that healing process may lead to something like reparations. It may need, lead to something other than a welfare question. Second part of that, if I may, second part of that has to do with what we in our communities must do in terms of our own communities. That while we can criticize and whine and talk all that rhetoric, we do have to develop and first criticize. A lot of these people, unfortunately, are imprisoned by their own, uh, by their attacks on each other. We have to criticize that. We do have to bring family together. We have to dialogue on that and stop worrying only about what they think or he thinks. But we do have to recognize that, that it is a we and not an American until America has healed its wounds. Thank you all very much.